Well, thank you uh, first. Uh, my name is Chaitanya Dahagam, and let's see, the clicker's here, got it, okay. Uh, Chaitanya Dahagam, but first I just want to say thank you to uh, uh, Jamie and the whole, whole uh, Care Connection Language Access Networks team, great event. Um, and the, the beauty is, and I kind of was like, well, I'm going last, kind of cool, but the beauty of going last is, you know, everything that's been discussed for the last two, three days has kind of been building up to a huge pile of data that's flown at you at a high velocity, high volume, high velocity, and now you've got to figure out what you're going to do with this data. And so it's kind of setting me up to say, all right, let me see if I can help you with some ideas so when you get back to your organizations, you have an idea of, hey, maybe I can call that Watson guy to figure out what I can do with this structured, unstructured data and so forth, and that's what I'm going to jump into. Um, a little bit on my background um, to get that out of the way. Um, I'm born and raised in Alabama. I have an undergraduate degree in computer science. I went to med school uh, in UAB in Birmingham, Alabama. Did five years of general surgery training. And the reason I give this background is that's the perspective from which I look at technology and medicine and even business at this point. As a surgeon, I wanted to fix not only the patients, I wanted to fix the system. You all know this. It's hard to fix the system from the inside. Some of you, the interpreters that are working with folks, nurses, care managers, and so forth, so forth, you guys, all of you, uh, were saying the same things that I as a consultant said. So after surgery, I did consulting. But you listened to me because I had a suit. <laughs> even though saying the exact same thing. That's not fair, that's not cool. So I actually left clinical medicine in 2011 and actually went to uh, Ethan's place. I worked at the advisory board company for four years, did health IT consulting, loved it. Um, but five months ago, joined the IBM Watson ecosystem team to really figure out how can we identify and define health-related use cases for organizations large and small to help them focus on being practitioners and let a machine potentially do all the impersonal stuff. That's gonna be the theme. If you have to step out and leave early, the theme of this is Watson's mission, my mission, our mission, is the IBM Watson ecosystem is to help practitioners be more personal and let a machine do the impersonal things that are taking you away from your patients. Okay? That's the take home. All right. So, the title of the talk is Building the Cognitive Hospital. Before we get to that, we have to define what is cognitive computing? What do I even mean by cognitive? So, let me talk about what that means first and foremost. So, I won't read off the screen here, but essentially what we're trying to do is make things personal. That's really the piece. Let you practitioners go be personal. Don't worry about doing the business intelligence, the structured, unstructured data analysis, digging through charts, going to PubMed, all this other stuff. Yes, validate it if a machine presents that information to you, but you need to sit with your patients. You need to talk to your patients. You need to learn about their weekend. What stressed them out to where today their blood pressure is 160 over 90 when last week it was 120 over 80 and they were doing just fine. They're not on medications or whatever. So that's really what it is. Cognitive computing is helping us in the next era of computing. The previous era was machine or programmatic programming algorithms. Maybe we made a little bit of progress with relational databases and running queries on those types of structured data sets. But cognitive computing is enabling us to take all the data, which we'll dig into a little bit, and integrating it with your existing platforms so you can understand what is happening in the data beyond the biases. You told, you wanted to, have, you had a specific hypothesis or a query, you found a relationship. But what other relationships exist? Let a machine do that. That's what cognitive computing is. It's the next era. So when we think about traditional computing, we're taking data, we're running business intelligence or analytics on it. You guys are very familiar with this. Some of you may have paid a lot of money to a lot of consultants to come in and tell you how to do this, maybe even sell you some of their software, on top of the EHRs that you paid a ton of money for. Now you had to pay for additional technology to analyze all the data that the EHRs generate. And that's just the EHR. We haven't even talked about all the other data. We will in a second. But what cognitive computing is going to enable us to do is where does this data extend to? What does all this data connect to beyond my four walls of my hospital, my clinic, my, maybe even beyond my, just my job. So what, that's what cognitive computing is here to do. So the other take home message, if you can take home, is we as human beings are not going to be replaced as practitioners. That's not what I'm here to do. Watson's not, I will not let that happen. Because again, I have three hats and that's just not something I'm going to allow happen. I've seen Terminator too many times uh, and I, it's not happening. Sorry, I am not going down as the bad guy at the end of Terminator 2. Um, and, and apologizing to Arnold or whatever version of Arnold it is. Um, we as human beings need to be the practitioners. We are the ones that need to be talking to the patients about what, is, what ails them. You have appendicitis, we need to take your appendix out. Don't worry, I know you haven't been in an operation before, but here's what the informed consent walk, they need that. We need that as providers. That's why we go into medicine. We don't need to sit there in front of an EHR digging through it and looking through data sets. We don't need to be going through Excel spreadsheets. We do not need to be doing that. A machine can do the impersonal stuff. 
Let us do the personal stuff as humans. Let the machine do the impersonal stuff, and together we are partners. And it's the other, the other kind of uh, horse, dead horse I will beat, it's what I do, um, is we are not, this is not artificial intelligence. This is enhanced intelligence. These Watson capabilities that we are training and integrating together is in, taught by us, trained by us. It's not artificial. We put the first set of intelligence in. The machine is going to help us enhance that intelligence, and then we work together as partners. All right, great. So what's Watson? I kind of alluded to it. Watson, um, so I know we had a Jeopardy champion here, but we actually have another Jeopardy champion here, Watson. <laughs> so no, not to take anything away from you, Ethan. Exactly right, and Mr. Jennings and Mr. Rudder, and good thing you called out Rudder, not a lot of people remember that name either. So that's a good one, yeah, see? Um, so, yeah, so, but that was our original use case. How many of you are familiar with what the reference we just made to Watson and Jeopardy? Okay, for those of you who don't know, in 2011, Watson actually went on Jeopardy and won Jeopardy. I think Watson missed one question and he was pretty, it, not he, she, it's an it, it won. But the thing about that, what we took away from that, it was based on one API, one application program interface which was what's called Q&A. Since it's been sunsetted, we've got much more sophisticated technologies and capabilities now. But what Watson did was that was a specific use case. The corpus of information that had to be connected for that was very focused. It was general trivia. A lot of information had to be connected, but from a machine standpoint, very easy to pull all those different networks, have a corpus of in in intelligence, and receive training on the relationships to look for, and then uh, speech to text. Take the speech question, the spoken question, convert it to text, come up with the relationship, spit out an answer, oh, by the way, in the form of a question. <laughs> so that was the use case, Watson won. That was our proof of concept to the world. That was five years ago. Now we've got much more sophisticated technologies um, that underlie this machine. So when people think about Watson, that's one of the first things I wanted to convey is, what is Watson? It's, it's, is it this big black box we can just go throw anything at it and ask a question? Technically, yes. But when you dissect it and you look at Watson, it is a core set of integrated capabilities, typically in the form of APIs. These are some of our publicly available APIs. Um, and we have some custom and research ones because obviously we're always working in the lab and trying to get things from test beta to a public API. And it's an integrated set of those capabilities focused on a very uh, defined use case. So for healthcare, for example, the only real ones that I actually, we pull out a lot from the off the shelf are things like retrieve and rank and uh, trade-off analytics. What do I mean by that? Well, we have custom healthcare annotators that natural language processors or whatever, or classifiers or whatever, they'll read healthcare data. So EHR notes, for example. Parse through it and build relationships. The relationships that are initially built are the ones we tell Watson to look for. So Watson, you, you know, I think this patient's a diabetic, but there's no 250.0 uh, ICD-9 code, or I don't even know the ICD-10 code because I just decided not to learn it. Um, so that's the code. And so uh, clearly, there's clearly some structured elements that say this patient's diabetic. But what about reading through the note? I saw that there was a mention of diabetes in an HNP 10 years ago. Is this patient diabetic? Or I saw a hemoglobin A1C referenced, but it's not in the structured field in the lab section. Is this patient a diabetic? So Watson, I need you to look through all these different data sets, structured and unstructured, and tell me if this patient's a diabetic or not. With and what degree of certainty. And we have to do it in a way. Watson, do it in a way so I can trace back and figure out exactly how you came to that conclusion. That's, Watson can do that right now. We're doing that in labs. We're designing use cases to do that. The cool part of it, the fun part of Watson, is when Watson brings to earth relationships that our biases prevent us from asking. So for example, this is a very off the wall example. I use it just because it kind of resonates. It's crazy if you think about it. But Watson comes back and says, you know, so and so, I found you know, this patient's diabetic because A1C was mentioned 10 years ago in this HNP. OK, diabetic, great. I also found that everyone who has this type of cat is a diabetic. I'm not going to tell what, or anyone to look for a correlation between diabetes and cats. It's just it's not in the literature. It's not how I was trained as a doctor, whatever. That's how we're thinking. And that's how Watson can put together data. Now, it's not cats. It might be diabetes and a particular zip code or a particular restaurant that's in that area. You think about all the different industries, then, that we can connect to with healthcare. You're going beyond the four walls. You're going beyond that spreadsheet. You're going beyond structured data. And you are connecting with other data sources. It looked up cat because PubMed said that diabetics and cats in India have, are correlated. No doctor or endocrinologist is going to do that. But Watson can do that. 
if you just think about the sheer volume and velocity of data. That's why we need to do it. And then connecting it to other industries. Watson is the ecosystem, in the IBM Watson ecosystem, we're focused not only on healthcare, but all these other industries that being able to have that intelligence, especially with Internet of Things, wearables, finance, understanding patterns of when someone buys something, those people are more prone to have diabetes. How what we choose to do with that information, those insights, is up to us as human beings. But we are now finding able, we are able to use a machine to help us find those correlations. So the, the kind of the take home message, and I'll read this verbatim, is that we're doing all this, but you can see the human being is still needed there to validate that insight. Is it relevant to know that a diabetic has a particular cat? Maybe, maybe not. But we at least have now insights that have gone beyond our biases and been brought to light that we can figure out as human beings how to talk to patients about it. Maybe it's not the cat. Maybe it's the type of cat food that's bought at a certain time and they buy this for, who knows, we can go on and on, so I'm not even going to try. But at the end of the day, our machines should be nothing more than tools for extending the powers of the human beings who use them. Watson, cognitive computing, whatever you want to use that's going to help us handle the volume of data at the velocity at which it is generated is our, our partner. It enhances the intelligence that we already have and helps us focus on being more personal and let a machine do the impersonal things. Again, take home message. Now, with all that being said, I'm about to show you a video of a robot doing human things. <laughs> so before it starts, it's about <clears throat> vision and language capabilities. A lot of the use cases, especially in healthcare when you think about it, it's all about natural language processing and then building relationships based on the natural language that's been processed and then training Watson to understand that. So this is kind of an example of how that training happens. Um, and then also throwing in visual recognition, image analysis, some of the core capabilities that Watson can do right now. Let's see if this works. Eli, grab it. Eli, grab it. I'm confused. Which of the four things do you mean? Eli, what color is the object on the left? It's blue. Eli, grab it. Eli, grab that object. <laughs> this is where Da Vinci needs to go. <laughs> Eli, grab the white thing. Do you mean this one? No, the other one. Eli, grab the green thing. Sorry, that's too big for me. <laughs> and then just one more, I think it's about 20 seconds or so. Eli, what is the object on the left? I don't know. Eli, that object is aspirin. Okay, I guess it's aspirin. Eli, this object is Advil. Okay, that is an Advil. Eli, how many Advil do you see? I see two. Eli, poke the thing in the middle. I don't know how to poke something. Eli, point at it. Eli, extend your hand. Eli, retract your hand. Eli, that is how you poke something. <laughs> okay, now I know how to poke something. Eli, poke the red object. <laughs> So I love that uh, video, uh, at least for two reasons. The, the first reason is it just illustrates how we are training, how you have that. You can see the relationships being built, but it has to start somewhere. It's not artificial. It's from the human being that, that taught it, and the machine will, over time, use cognitive capabilities to enhance it, keep continuously learning. The second reason I love it, I just love the background. You know, we think IBM, these big research labs, and that's someone's desk at someone's house. <laughs> There's like a C-clamp down there with a piece of wood. There's family pictures all over. They probably grab the Advil bottles from their medicine cabinet or whatever to do this. It's just cool, and it's just the kind of the startup feel we have in Watson, just kind of plug that a bit. 
Um, and the, oh, the third reason I do like it is just your imagination runs wild now. Now you're like, well, what about this? What about that? This next one I think is going to be a really cool um, from an imagination standpoint. Just Watson, think about it. I need it help you. with acquisitions. Hello. How can I help you with mergers and acquisitions? Watson, show me companies with revenue between $25 million and $60 million pertaining to analytics. Let's see what I can find. I found 87 companies. Nice. Okay. So that's a good start. What that's do you think, Brian? But I was doing some homework, actually. I think we should pull on that Watson Strategy Group document. There's a lot of key concepts in there. Let's feed it to Watson. All right. Watson, please regard this as cognitive strategy. Watson, show me companies with revenue between $15 million and $60 million pertaining to cognitive strategy. Let's see what I can find. Yeah, this is nice. I found 112 mm. companies. Now we're getting a lot in here. And we can see we're, we're getting some connections to it. Watson, show me companies that are about analytics and cognitive strategy that are most similar to the companies named Wolfram Alpha and Kawasaki Robotics. I found three companies huh? similar to the oh. ones you specified. Beautiful. Well, let's see what we think of these. Dive a little deeper. Let's compare these things. Sure. Watson, show me a decision table. Here is a decision table that will enable you to compare companies side by side. Watson, place the companies named Wolfram Alpha and Kawasaki Robotics and Cognolytics and Raytheon BBN Technologies and Decisive Analytics in the decision table. Okay. Nice. Okay, but I think we need a little more than that. We need some uh, other attributes. Watson, place the attributes named revenue and employees and corporate structure in the decision table. Okay. All right, so now uh, we've got this side-by-side -side comparison. What do you think? Yeah, I uh, think that's right. Watson, give me a suggestion. I have a suggestion. So that's where my brain goes wild, is just think about healthcare. If you think about that corporate strategy document, the HR notes, you think about some of the other data about Wolfram Alpha and so forth, Google, PubMed, that kind of. So you start thinking about, these are the networks that right now I'm thinking, then I bring it back down, not down, I bring it back across or wherever as a physician. I'm sitting there, I'm seeing this patient with this particular condition, and I did this on rounds all the time in the ICU. We would sit there around and the attending would be spouting about some kind of uh, article about, well, you know, this patient so-and-so, ARDS, blah, blah, blah. Okay, great. This, so we need to do this particular modality. How do you know that this patient would not be excluded from that study? How do you know that this patient would meet the inclusion criteria for that study? And I did that every day on rounds from 2006 to 2011 in the surgical ICU in San Antonio, Texas. You don't. And who of us, is a, and this was 80 hour work week and I still couldn't do it. I was getting there going, am I going to go sit down and pull up PubMed? No, I've got 20 other patients to round on. I got to change lines. I got to make sure that I got to go to the OR because I was in surgery, all that. So you're doing all those things. Who has the time to do that? Watson does. Let Watson do that impersonal stuff so then I can go and talk to the family about why that central line's infected and I need to change it and put them on a new set of antibiotics and they're still stuck in the ICU and can't go uh, off to the floor. Okay, so those are some of the, that's, the, that's what we're trying to do. So that's why I, IBM Watson for healthcare. So, d d you know, I won't read off the slide, but it's really, at the end of the day, number one, we've, we're so smart as doctors and practitioners and interpreters and nurses and so forth. We're all super smart. We're all in this for the patient. Let's make that assumption. Let's just say it's true across the board. Despite that, we still make mistakes. Okay, there, we make mistakes. We have all this information, but we're still making mistakes. Number two, we have all this information on evidence. We tout ourselves as practicing evidence-based medicine. 50% of the time or less, we're not even using the evidence we have because we just do not have time. And we have biases that may even prevent us from implementing some of the, the pieces. Let's say the patient was, uh, would be included in that study, but I'm biased against that author, I'm biased against that journal, I'm biased, I didn't know those impact. We have biases. And third, it's what's happening is patients are getting older, they're getting more chronic, and we're having to take care of them uh, for chronic conditions that may, maybe we don't even see them, we're not even reaching them. They're not even in front of us. How do we get this information and so forth to them? Okay, so I told you we're, we're making mistakes, we're not personal, we're not using evidence, we can't reach our patients, so it's still costing us a ton of money. <laughs> These are ridiculous numbers. Oh, and at the time that we're doing all this, more data's coming in. It's still, it's, you're doing this and data's still flowing in, still coming in, still coming in. We need to stop, <laughs> we need help. We need a machine, again, beating dead horse, Machine, do the impersonal stuff and let me be a doctor. Machine, do the impersonal stuff, let me take care of my patient. 
that's what we're, that's the value proposition. That's the moonshot with Watson for health. Okay, so now let's think about, let's bring it to the patient. When we look at a particular, an individual patient, you think about the healthcare data that you have, that's only 10% of the data, 0.4 terabytes per person for a lifetime. Look at all the other information, 23andMe, 30% genomic data that's out there. We're not even taking it into consideration. 60% exogenous factors. What's this person eating? What's this person, uh, how is this person sleeping? What's this person doing? All the stuff that the data has been collected, 1,100 terabytes per person. My perspective, Watson's perspective, IBM's perspective is, and I hope this goes over well with you guys, let Watson focus on the terabytes. We'll focus on Tara, the patient, as humans. That seems reasonable. That's a ton of stuff. We can't even wait. If we're lucky, if we get through a tenth of that as a human for one patient, multiplied by all the patients you see and all the different care settings you have and all the data that you can't connect together. Speaking of all the data we can't connect together, look at all this data that this individual is generating. And these are the different areas in within which this patient information lives. So Tara, her information lives in all these entities. It's not connected. So it's just data. We may be lucky and be able to get some spreadsheet from here, an extract from here, put it together and get some insights. But are the insights enough to make a solution? Are the insights enough, and kind of the theme, one of the conversation points yesterday from the panel, are the insights enough for us to tell people to change policy? Are they? We don't know, because someone's always going to argue against it. For, for, for just, you know, we can, we can argue later. <laughs> I'm making a lot of bold statements up here, and feel free to pull me aside later and say, dude, you're wrong. Um, but this is my perspective with my three hats. So that's what we need to do. We need to be able to, for Tara and other patients, go from data, the insights we have, to solutions utilizing all the data so that we can do all the things that Tara and her, all other patients like her need. By the way, we do all that and the data keeps rolling in. There's a new device, a new day. Every day there's a new device that's giving us more data. So we have to build it in such a way, we have to connect it in such a way that, this is a term you can feel free to, we have to build data, data lakes so that the data can just flow in, doesn't matter where it's coming in, when it's coming in, and then we have to be able to run our IBM Watson capabilities, cognitive capabilities, some kind of machine capability on that lake to deliver the solutions that we need. So that's what, I, that's what we're proposing with IBM Watson. That's what we're building, we're scoping out. So uh, there's at least 10 or 15 for healthcare because we can't do it out of the box with those APIs and so forth. We do a lot of custom work. But really trying to build a, a cognitive health system that takes all this data, that helps us be human, take care of our patients, hold our patient's hand, hand them a Kleenex when we, t when we tell them they have cancer. But the machine is doing all the, the data crunching, all the impersonal stuff, so we can go back to the normal Rock, Norman Rockwell picture. One more video and then I'll wrap up real quick. Watson has spent the last couple of years in healthcare doing amazing things, helping pharmaceutical companies and universities find new drugs. It's been working with doctors to literally learn healthcare and come back and help advise doctors on what they might do in terms of treatments. Now there's an explosion of devices also that's generating data. Those devices are going to start to capture enormous amounts of information about us as humans. They have capabilities that are going to fuel a data explosion. That data explosion is going to fuel the next generation of health and healthcare. What if we're able to connect that information directly back to your doctor? Over the last two years, we've, we've really focused in on delivering new healthcare solutions around Watson. We're going to extend that capability to our new Watson Health Cloud. We're going to have a new analytics platform called Watson Health Insights that extends the capability with dramatic new research analytics that will enable us to build whole new solutions in a secure environment. We will build the most secure cloud to handle this information. We will strip the identity of the individual from the data to ensure the privacy of the individual. We'll be able to apply our massive scale cloud technology, our highest security, and deep, deep analytics such as Watson will put these capabilities then in the hands of the healthcare providers, the doctors, the nurses, to be there instantaneously helping them make better decisions. The hope is to have an open innovation platform, if you will. Institutions can come 
leverage such platform, leverage the analytics, leverage all these insights that could be derived from their data in order to better cater to the needs of the patient. With the amount of information that's being produced, IBM is one of the only companies that can put together that secure, safe, cloud-based environment to ensure your privacy at a scale that will enable researchers, doctors, providers, patients, and consumers to access all of the information. This complete platform really is a first and I think is going to transform healthcare. We're excited about the launch of the healthcare division because it allows us to grow this ecosystem in even broader and deeper ways. Just as we saw within the first year of Watson overall, um, I am sure we will see thousands of new use cases coming our way and it'll give us a chance to really extend the reach of these cognitive services into new places. We're going into things like wellness, working with different partners, and we're going into helping researchers and drug discovery, going into clinical trials, both from a, a patient perspective and how we uh, match patients to particular trials, and helping to advance clinical research in that way. We have an opportunity to truly get to places and to people that other people couldn't get to today. I think we're really primed to, to make a lot of advancements in healthcare, and, and there's been a lot of demand for it. I'm very confident that we are starting something major and big and transformative in healthcare and life sciences. I think in the end, when we look back, Watson will be disease's worst enemy. We're going to really change healthcare on the face of the planet. So two reasons I really like that video. First, a lot of smart smart people, people smarter than me who are able to talk about it much more eloquently than I am. But second, you saw some imaging in there about the, you saw some of the annotation or the, the natural language from cancer and so forth. And you saw that big dark room that's called our Watson Experience Center in New York. There's a couple other places. You can actually come in and see Watson, for example, I'm not going to give the diagnosis away, a patient with a condition that on hospital day six, the humans found it just on their own without machine uh, uh, Watson support. Whereas with, with machine support, just a story, uh, an example, on hospital day two, potentially. So it's, and, and that's, you can go in there and see the connections, all the EHR records come up on the screen, you can see the connections that are being made and that kind of thing. Um, so get back to then now the cognitive hospital. Let's focus on that. So what does it look like? So I took this and I said, all right, um, you know, I, I thought about what would it be like to be a hospital CEO? <laughs> I, and I did this exercise like, I don't want to be a hospital CEO. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we look at this and just start on the left side. You rotate, this is a traditional hospital, okay? This is the hospital CEO. He's, he, he or she is trying to understand, what do I need to do? Step one, build, put the lights on, infrastructure administration. I need providers. I need devices and diagnostic equipment, blah, 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 down the road. IT system, you may or may not be thinking about connectivity at that point, but I just need to get an EHR system up and running. I need to get these folks seeing patients, and I need to get that meaningful use or whatever it's going to be next year now that it's going to go in away. Number 10 is the patient on this list if you start. Number 10 is the patient. That's who this is all for. But number 10 is the patient. You can't even get patients in the door without marketing. That's why I put marketing above patients. It's tactical. Then, let's say you get the patient and you get all the data, and then you can actually maybe, if you're lucky, focus on public health, social programs. Um, and if you're really on top of it, a big center, like you know, the previous presenter talked about some of the big uh, companies like Intel and Boeing that are doing big employer. Well, only the big health systems are the ones that are doing some of the sophisticated stuff because they have the money and the resources to open innovation labs. But let's say you're one of those folks. Then you can start saying, you know what, I'm going to be innovative, I'm going to be sophisticated, we're going to have our own health plan, we're going to start taking risk. We've got the data, we've got, we can leverage and we can start talk risk contracts, we can do all that cool stuff that, 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 that's out there. But, oh, and by the way, I put analyst and consultants there because that kind of bit me when I saw money coming to me as a consultant that I felt would be better if it went to patient care. Just so, sidebar there. Um, but if they're lucky, they're able to take the data and go to insights and get to solutions. But they're not thinking about it foundationally. It's, they're not thinking about how are we going to connect it. They're trying to just get up, up and going. And you'll notice that that left side, that's where the intersection with the patient is. That graphic on, is intentionally the same on this side as it was on the patient side. That's the intersection of the health system and the patient, of the hospital and the patient. Cognitive hospital, none of that goes away. It all stays. But now you're thinking about it in a way of how do I put together a lake? to connect all this data foundationally, just like I would think about the infrastructure and to keep the lights on, to keep the water flowing. Um, same thing, I need to have pipes to connect all my data. And IBM Watson, we, we feel, can be that cognitive hospital solution to help for a variety of those bring the data in so then you can maybe move the patient higher up in this chain. And then you can also 
focus more on the ways to help that patient outside of the hospital. Kind of counterintuitive. You do all this stuff to build the cognitive hospital to see how you, to help you provide and take care of the patient outside of the hospital. Keep the patient out of the hospital. So that's some of the, 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 that's what kind of the overall proposition is. And Watson's doing some of this already. So when we think about practitioners, you saw some examples there. Watson for Oncology is already that clinical decision support that some hospitals are rolled out. We partnered and trained it with Memorial Sloan Kettering. We built the technology. MSK uh, helped us train it um, so that we have clinical decision support, for example, uh, oncology advisors for some uh, practitioners. We have um, uh, some, some patient information to help them. Uh, actually, th from a social program standpoint, they can, there's a company out in San Diego that's built a solution where uh, patients can act, powered by Watson, patients can actually go in and say, I need this particular social service, and it finds the closest one to them, text to speech, natural language, that kind of thing. So those are some of the pieces that are there. Even going back to patients, clinical trial matching, we know that clinical trial matching um, is abysmal. It's a very low rate. I think 3 to 5% of patients who are eligible actually end up participating in one or in enrolling. Um, so we have a clinical trial matching solution. So we already have solutions out there. We need more. Um, and I'll get in trouble for this. I don't, honestly, as a physician, I don't care who builds it. I'd love it for it to be IBM. That's my IBM hat. But we need to do this regardless of who does it. And it's going to happen. Somebody's going to do it. And we'd love to, to find a way to work with all of you to help you all do it for your organizations and your patients. Um, there are, this is just a list of some of the partners. The way we kind of approach this model from IBM's perspective and some of the questions, I don't know if you all were here or if, uh, earlier days, but I ask a lot of questions. How do we help health systems do this? They don't have the margin, they don't have the resources. So we do it through partnerships. We with IBM, we work with, for example, I said a Memorial Sloan Kettering, or we'll have an IT vendor or another EHR vendor, small startup company, large independent software vendor. We partner with them. We need to partner with the health system so we can work with the practitioners, the providers, the, the technologies that they have. So it's all about partnerships. That's what the ecosystem is about, the IBM Watson ecosystem. Just some kind of patting ourselves on the back to give evidence that there are uh, real health leaders and organizations that are partnering with us and having good results. We need more. It's not enough. Um, and then I'll just kind of end with how can you get it. Um, you can call me, email me. I gave my business card to several folks. I'll leave a stack out if people want it, but, um, and my email address will be up here. Email me, contact me. I will work with you to help figure out is there a use case here? How do we bring all this together for your organization, for your patients, your, the people that you take care of? Um, but you also then get introduced. So we're beyond the technology. You get to be introduced. Maybe your organization built something really, really cool and you just need a health system partner to get you off the ground. Maybe you are a health system and you just need an IT company that's focused on something that's very important to you and your patients. We'll partner you up. That's some of the networking pieces that you get from our ecosystem. Um, so the question is, what will you do with IBM Watson? And that's really, that's it.